Hey, good job, Chad. Way to go, Dale. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Move those feet, big guy. Great work, great work, great work. Great job, great job. All right. All right, take a break, get a drink. Great job. What's up, y'all? I'm Coach Keith today. I'm going to be your host for Verified Part 4. Verified is our new single series. It's a series singles for singles series. It's a series for singles. How did I tongue tie myself? Anyway, this is part four. And what Verified is all about is, it's all about uh, in the world of social media, when you reach a certain status, you reach a certain fame in your career or in your persona, you get verified. They give you a blue check. And the reason why we call this series very Verified is because in society, a lot of single people don't get the respect they deserve if they're not in some kind of committed relationship. Like in our culture, that kind of verifies you once you're booed up. But I don't believe that's true. I believe you're verified because God says you're verified. And God says you're verified so much that he would die for you. Whoo! You thought I was to die for! Ooh. How y'all like that? <laughs> yeah, I wrote that song for Anf I I co-wrote that song with Anf I wrote Anthony Brown an email and thanked him for that song. Anyway, in the first two parts of this series, we looked at how to deal with the dating and relating space, how to make sure you're avoiding pitfalls and asking the right questions and making sure you're making the right moves so that you don't end up in a situation that you'll later regret. Then last week, we looked at not relationships, but how to maximize yourself as a single. And today, as your coach, I'm going to be giving you coaching tips on all things single. We're going to talk about everything as a single. But before we get into it today, we're going to start with some warm-ups. Because you shouldn't practice without warming up. And I got to warm you up by getting your mind right. Because just like sports is mostly mental, being a single is really about having your mental state right. And one of the things we got to get right in our mentals as people, and especially as singles, is understanding the difference in life between this and that. I really mean that. I'm serious when I say it. You got to understand there's a science between understanding this and that. Check this out. All right, let's do our sprints now. Verse 13. Accept the way God does things. Everybody say accept. Accept the way God does things. Who can straighten with he's made crooked? Look at the end of verse 14. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. Okay, let me do it like this. I'm going to show you why a lot of us live with a level of depression that we're not even aware of. Every single person listening to me listening to this broadcast, watching this DVD, or wh wherever you are, every single human being has what I call a this in your life. And a this is, is something medical, is, or is something financial, is something relational, is something personal, is something spiritual, whatever that is, whatever this is, it ain't how you want it. It's something wrong. It could be a painful thing, it could be a, an illness, it, it, it's something that you wish were different. How many of you would agree you got a this in your life, right? Everybody got one. The ones who didn't put their hand up, your this is you got a lying problem. That's your this. <laughs> now, <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. We are praying that our this will become that. 
So even though it's sick, I'm, believe, I'm praying that God will heal it. Right? And I, even though it's broken, I'm praying that God will fix it. That's our that. Right? Now, the Bible says, from a wise man, accept what God allows. Because nothing is certain in this life. But what we do is, and I'm not saying, we, I'm not saying we're wrong with doing it. What we do is, because we're so upset with how this is, and because we're focused on God making it that, even when there's incremental progress on our this, we still don't change how we feel about it because it ain't that yet. I know I'm helping somebody. So, so your child, until they graduate from college and get a job, that it ain't that. But even if they just stop smoking so much, we don't thank God for that. We don't thank God for this because it ain't that. So even, so yeah, I ain't falling for the okie doke because this ain't what I pray for. And so we're missing every, life is going on under our nose while we're waiting on that to happen. You understand what I'm saying? So here's my question to y'all. Here's my question to you. I want to ask you a serious question. What if this never becomes that? Oh, he done been across the line. He done crossed the line now. That's why I ain't never coming to this church. I ain't across the line now. How you going to tell me? Now, this is where it gets conflicted for Christians because we are people of faith, and we believe that God is able to change this to that. Won't he do it? That's what we say. Won't he do it? We only say won't he do it after he did it, by the way, right? So because our God is capable of making this that. We don't want anybody telling us what if this didn't become, no, never becomes that. Because you ain't about to tell me that this ain't, what you, going, what you talking about, Keith? We ain't supposed to believe God for miracles? We ain't supposed to pray and ask God for the unexpected? We ain't supposed to pray God? As, I'm saying yes, we are. As children of God, we have the right to ask him for whatever we want to ask him for. But I'm still going to ask you the question, what if this never becomes that? Now, you put your whole life on hold because, watch this, here's the point I put up. Your future is so, you're so fused to your future that you're missing moments. So you can't appreciate any progress because you ain't going to get happy till that happens. And I'm going to ask you one more time, what if this never becomes that? And you know what you're going to say? Oh, no, you ain't gonna, I ain't even received that. It's going to happen. I'm going to get healed, Pastor, and I ain't going to need medicine. My, I, I'm going to get buried to a Christian man who has his own business, and I'm going to have kids. I'm 54. I'm going to have kids. I already got names for them. I already know what school they're going to go to. It's going to happen. My child is going to graduate from God. It's going to happen. And you, say, and you know why it's going to happen, Keith? It's going to happen because God told me it's going to happen, and he promised me. Oh, did he? God, so God said that. Or oh, is your that so big that you made it his that? <laughs> and meanwhile, you will, you will live with a constant low-grade depression until that happens. And I'm saying you better snap out of that and, be, and begin to embrace this and say, Lord, I thank you for this now. It ain't what, it ain't what I wanted to be, but it ain't what it used to be either. I thank in this, who am I talking For this I give you praise. That's a mature praise right there. I learned how to praise you for this. I learned how to applaud you for this. It used to be down here. Now it's right here. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It ain't all the way over here yet, but I'm grateful. You got everything on hold waiting on that to happen. God is good in the gap. All right, guys. Now, we can't warm up without stretching. So I need all of y'all to stretch, especially my veterans on the team. My old guys, you've been around the team for years now. I need to make sure you old guys get your stretching in. My veterans, get your stretching in, all right? Let's get to stretching. And just like I need them to stretch, I need my mature singles, my seasoned singles. I need to stretch you right now. What do you mean, Pastor? I need to stretch some of my seasoned mature singles on your, on your mindset. 
Because some of you treat the past like it's golden. Like you, made a, you make an idol out of the past. And that's okay to look back at the past with favor as long as it doesn't interfere with your life right now and it doesn't interfere with your future. You got to look at the past and sometimes you got to leave your past in the past. All right? All right, let's start with cherry pickers and then do your Frankenstein kicks. Let's go. Verse 10 says, stop making an idol out of the old days. That's how I interpret it. We, we tend to make an idol out of here. Stop longing for the good old days because it's not wise. I call that making an idol out of our history. You ever hear us, oh, now I'm, I'm over 50 years old, so I'm part of that group now. I remember when I thought 41 was old. I remember I was a teenager and I said, 41? 41? <laughs> now I'm 70 is young. Like, you just a baby. You 70? You just getting started. But you know how old people talk about the past like it's the greatest thing ever? Like that was when they had real music. This old stuff y'all listen to now, that ain't no music. Everything old is good, everything new, something wrong with it. And they talk about the new, they talk about the old as if there was nothing wrong back then. Like you mean to tell me what nobody said? Well, why would y'all get divorced? Well, people could, well, well, nobody depressed, well, nobody mad at each other. We talk about the old days as if it was perfect. It's like, it's like euphoric. We only remember the good about it. We talk about being hungry and not being upset. How you going to be hungry and not upset? We just ate sugar sandwiches. <laughs> Two pieces of bread, just threw some sugar in there. That's all we had. We was happy. I bet you wanted some meat. You lying. We walked to school both ways uphill. How are you going to do that? And there wasn't no hills you went down? All the way uphill both ways. <laughs> you lying. Everybody in our community spoke to each other. We was neighbors. It was a village. If you got in trouble, you get a beat. Miss Millie beat you. Miss Mabel beat you. Man, I ain't happy about that. That's three beatings. Why well, I'll be happy about that. <laughs> don't speak to me if you're going to beat me. I don't want that. We try to make it up. We used to be mama, big mama, feed 15 of us. Wasn't but five people in the family. Be 15 of us in the house. And big mama just get two eggs and some hamburger helper and flour. And that was it. She make feed 15 of us. I bet you wanted pizza when you saw pizza on TV. We ain't had video games. We had cell phone. They had iPad. They had computer. We played outside. And everybody was happy. You lying. I bet you wanted a bike. I bet you didn't want to sleep in the same bed with somebody peeing on you and their feet in your face. You're trying to act like it was six of us in the same bed. That ain't no happiness. I want my own bed. And what we do is we make an idol out of what's... Let me tell you what's wrong with that. You know why that's not wise? Thank you, Lord. I'm feeling so demonstrative today. How about that word, demonstrative? See, when you say the past was great... It makes you not appreciate now. So now there's a gap between where you are and the good old days. And so you long for what was instead of appreciating what is. This is the day the Lord has made. That's what I'm talking about. That's my helper right here. I will rejoice and be glad in this day. Right now, this is God says I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. How can you say it was only good back then? That means I ain't no good anymore? See, when you, somebody say embrace now. When you only long for what was, you keep being married to something that's over. And you're missing what's happening now. There are moments right now you ought to be grateful for. Moments going on in your life right now you ought to appreciate. Stop appreciating your old wife, your old job, your old school, your old church, your old neighborhood. I'm not saying you don't appreciate your past. Don't worship it. Listen, y'all, I need everybody to declare this with me. Not just my season singles, everybody watching right now, everybody listening right now, I need you to make this declaration, either out loud or in the chat room. Y'all ready? Here's the declaration. Here's, here it is. My best days are still in front of me. That's what I'm talking about. My best days are still in front of me. I have not seen my best days yet. My best laugh is still in front of me. My happiest moments still in front of me. My greatest accomplishments are still in front of me. Yeah, my past is over, my present is blessed, my future is bright because God is good. 
I am good right now. You need to stop, have contentment with where you are right now. Don't worry, like, like and, and don't expect marriage to be the fix for that, like, like you're unhappy because you're ma unmarried. Listen, there's some, un there's some married people that feel like they're on punishment. Your singlehood is not a punishment. There are married people that feel like they're on punishment. Nobody's on punishment. Life is just life for everybody. And you have to stop believing that anything circumstantially has to change in your life in order for you to be content. You understand what I'm saying? <whistles> hey, Rogers, come here. Bring it in. My man Rogers, what's up, buddy? Hey, listen, let me ask you something. Why your parents got a karate helmet hat on you? <laughs> this is football. That must have been your dad who did that. Anyway, listen here, Rogers. This is what I need you to do. I need you to stop acting like marriage is gonna be the answer to your contentment in life. You gotta be content being single, man. Even if you feel lonely sometimes. I know you feel lonely sometimes, but there's no loneliness like marital loneliness. If you think you're lonely now, Never mind. You, you understand what I'm saying, Rogers? Do you feel me on that? What does that have to do with football? It ain't got nothing to do with football. I'm just multitasking right now. Go back out there and put single coverage. Play single coverage on somebody. Get it? Single coverage. But, oh, Rogers, throw me the ball back first. My man. Hey, singles, listen. How many of y'all understand football? Yeah, you. Do, you. do you know anything about football? I'm asking you. Yes or no? No, yes, maybe, a little. Really doesn't matter how much you know, because I'm your coach. It's my job to teach you. Let me teach you something about football and scripture. In John chapter 10, verse 10, there's this epic battle going on in the invisible world between two opponents. And the scripture says that the thief, who's one opponent, his purpose is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And then it says in that same verse, but Jesus says, I have come that you may have a rich and satisfying life. Now watch this, how this connects to football. In the game of football, whenever you have the football, that means you're on offense. And every time you run a play, you have an opportunity to move the ball downfield towards your goal. But when you're moving the ball downfield, there is an opponent trying to stop you. Now, in every play, there's a position player called a quarterback who usually handles the ball on every play. And because of the importance of the position of quarterback, there are people on his team called an offensive line whose job is to protect him because of his value to the team. Because other people are trying to attack him, the offensive line is trying to protect him. Well, in the single life, it's very similar. As a single, you're like a quarterback. And every time God sends you an idea, a vision, a strategy, it's like running a play. And every time you move that play down the field, you're going to experience an attack from an enemy called Satan. And sometimes because you're single, you're going to feel like you're all alone. But I need to let you know, you're never alone. There's someone who's always blocking for you. Great job, Carlos. Good block, kid. Way to go. Purpose is God word. It, it requires an understanding of how he's wired me. What are my passions? What are my gifts? What are my abilities? What are my talents? What are my skills? What am I great at? Yeah. How have you uniquely wired me for your purpose? That is what purpose typically is shared. What we talk about when we talk about purpose typically. But when you look at this classic verse, it is clear that there are two purposes for our lives. There is a divine purpose over our life in the verse because we clearly see that Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came to give you a rich and satisfying life. That is a divine purpose. But as sheep, which this whole passage is talking about sheep and describes us as sheep, but there is also a dark purpose in the same verse. The thief has a purpose for our life too. He is just as intentional. I've come to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And what I love about God, he doesn't try to dismiss the devil's purpose. I believe the thief is the devil. It's, an, it's a representation of the devil. It's a representation of, of darkness. God doesn't try to act like the thief doesn't have a purpose too. 
What is exciting about it is we can see the two diametrically opposed purposes in the verse. You see them? The dark purpose is to steal, to kill, destroy. The divine purpose is I came that you might have a rich and satisfying life. You see those diamonds. What we don't see is right between the verse is an invisible conflict. There's a war going on for dominion over whose purpose we will align to. In fact, in fact, the only reason the assignment of the devil and the attack of the devil has failed, the only reason he hasn't stolen, killed, and destroyed us in the A part of the verse is because what came in the B part of the verse. is because Jesus' purpose is greater than Satan's purpose. The only reason why it didn't work is because Jesus blocked it. If you know what I'm telling the truth, high five somebody say, he protected me. When people wanted to destroy me, he protected me. When somebody was looking to harm me, he protected me. When I was too drunk and too high to know where I was, somehow he got me back. Y'all ain't going to help me here to where I was supposed to be because he protected me. When I fell asleep behind the wheel and I don't know how I stayed in my lane, it was the Lord who protected me. When I put stuff in my body that could have destroyed me, my liver should be gone by now. My brain should be fried out by now. I should have full-blown AIDS right now, but the Lord protected me. See, I know you ain't going to tell the truth. You ain't going to testify in here because you don't want nobody to know what he brought you out of. But I dare you to give God a praise for what you can't even tell nobody out loud. The Lord protected me. I can't tell you everything, but he blocked it. <laughs> It may be jail time. He may have blocked my mental health problem. He may have blocked my suicide attempt. But whatever it is, I'm here today because he protected me. Protection. A protection. Protection. Along the way, be a fence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I need everybody right now to give it up for God and his protection. In fact, I know we're not in church physically together, and since we're not in church physically together and you can't stand up and thank God for protecting you where well, you can even wherever you are, but just so that your praise is known, I want you to let God know, I want you to let the devil know and everybody else know how grateful and appreciative you are for God's protection. Just type these three words, he protected me. <laughs> he protected me, yeah, he protected me. <laughs> He protected me. You can sit there and act like you got out on your own and you made it through on your own, but I'm going to tell you, trust me when I tell you, he protected me. I can't even tell you everything he protected me from and everything he brought me out of, but he protected me. Just know that it could have been the other way, and it would have been the other way, and it should have been the other way, but the Lord protected me. Mm -hmm. And I want all the singles to know this. Let me, let me tell you something. I know you feel like you're alone sometimes, but not only is God protecting you, but he's also providing for you too. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus is not only a protector. He's a provider. The, the verse doesn't just say that he protects us, that, that, that the enemy has a plan. The thief wants to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've I, I, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. See, it would have been enough if he had just stopped what the enemy was doing. Let me tell you something. If all Jesus ever did for us was stop the enemy's destruction in our life, that would have been a blessing right there. If I just lived on neutral, <laughs> if I didn't have nothing, if he just kept the devil from destroying me, that would have been enough. But he goes to a whole different level when he says, I'm not going to just protect you. I'm going to provide for you. Watch this. I've also come. My purpose is not just to protect you. It's to provide a rich and satisfying life. See, I believe that most of us, that most of us who have a background like me are more comfortable with the first part of the verse than the second part of the verse. We say it like we want the second part of the verse. We say it like we love that part of the verse, but we're more comfortable with the enemy, with warfare, with stealing, killing, and destroying, and fighting that devil all my life. I had to fight. We're more comfortable with that than God saying, than God saying, I want to give you a rich and satisfying life. What is that? What is that? What does that look like? What is a rich satisfying? And do I have the guts to deal with the haters if I ever walk into it? 
See, one of the things God's got to overcome in this purpose war is our own mentality. We have a poverty mentality. We don't think we deserve better. It's our race. It's our family. It's our origin. It's our background. I'm a woman. I'm a black man. I'm this. I'm that. I'm the other. All of these limitations. But I came to tell you who the sun sets free. Good God. It's free indeed. And no weapon. Don't make me preach it. Form to get you shall be able to prosper. And I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Come on, y'all. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up, everybody. Everybody. We got to give it up. We got somebody protecting us and providing for us. Come on. You don't have to be in church to give God some praise. He's worthy wherever you are. Wherever you are. All right? Give me a minute. <whistles> hey, Rogers. Bring it in, buddy. My man, my man. You good? I see they got you the right helmet. You're playing baseball. I got you the helmet. Man, you want something to drink? You don't? Well, I wasn't going to give you much anyway. I was going to give you this, man, because you ain't been playing good. You don't want All right. All right. Listen, man, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Do you, let me ask you a question. Because sometimes I wonder if you're really content as a single man. Are you really content? Do you really believe God loves you and that you're complete without a spouse? Do you believe that? You got to believe. Do you believe that in your head? Because if you don't believe that in your head and in your heart that I'm complete, with or without a person in my life, another human being, you will always feel incomplete. You know what I'm saying, Rogers? But what does that have to do with football? Well, right now we're talking about baseball, and it has nothing to do with either one. Just go out there. I told you it's 90% mental, man. Go out there. Go back out there and hit a single, man. Huh? You got that? Hit a single. Huh? How you like that? Now listen, all my singles, I want to tell you something. That promise in John chapter 10, verse 10, is not just for married people. Anybody that's connected to Jesus has that promise in their life. In fact, 1 first, first Corinthians 7.10 says that we are actually married to the Lord. So the only matrimonial relationship we need to be blessed and protected and provided for by God is to be in union with Christ. That's what matters the most. Now let me tell you one other thing. I don't just think blessings come just from our union with Christ, even though that's critical. Sometimes many of the blessings in our life comes from environments that we're a part of, from people we're connected to and places we're connected to. I've seen in my own life the people I'm related to and connected to, the organizations I'm connected to, the, the blessings on those organizations and people have spilt over into my life. For example, I, I'm proud of my relationship with Pastor John K. Jenkins Sr. of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, that pastor and that church has blessings on him and it that spill over into my life. And I've seen it work. There's some blessings that are contextual. They're based on your environment and your relationships and your connections. And I need to ask you as a single person to really evaluate who you're connected to in your life. Who are you, who are you vitally connected to organizationally and individually? It's important. Check this out. Hey guys, we can win this game if we play together. God gonna have you walking up and stuff, walking through doors you ain't got no business walking through because he opened them. And I believe that favor is on this house. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples. I may have told you already, but I'm gonna give them to you again. I'm gonna tell you two examples why I believe the favor of God is on this church. First of all, when that green belt, when that building on Greenbelt Road became available, I, J Pastor James and Terry Saleh were trying to buy it. I was just trying to lease it. I think they were trying to buy it. I need to clarify that. I never thought about buying it. I didn't think it was enough parking or any of that. I was just trying to lease it. Can y'all lease it to us? They said no. We're not leasing to a church. We're not going to have a church lease it. So I went in there trying to lease it. Guess what? We own it. That's favor. Wasn't even walking into it to buy it. Now we own the joint. You understand what I'm saying? That's favor. That's the kind of switches God's going to put on you. Now, some of y'all was laughing because I had a suit on at the daggone um, 
the thing, whatever the settlement, I had a suit on because I had a I, I was at an event where I was speaking on a platform with people I had no business at. The, I still don't know why they invited me to speak at this particular event. At the event, I met the president of Wesley Seminary, and he said, I'd like to have a meeting with you. I said, sure. He called me later and invited me to the meeting. We set the meeting up, so I had the meeting the same day as the settlement. I go to the meeting at Wesley Seminary, and the man who's the president of the seminary takes me on a tour of the seminary along with the department head of one of the chairs of the departments. I'm going on a tour of the facility. They have a master's of divinity program, master's of art program, master of theology program, a doctorate of ministry program, two doctoral programs, and I'm thinking, I ain't got nothing but a little undergraduate degree from Bible college, barely graduated from Washington Bible College. I'm thinking, I get this. They want this to be the place where I matriculate to go to the next level of education and training. This is where I'm going to do my graduate work. I'm pretty cool. I'm pretty impressed. They're recruiting me to study here. So when we got back to the office after the, after the tour, I sat down and said, well, which program do y'all think I should register for? I kind of, you know, fit in with my time. They said, wait a minute. We ain't asked you to come here to study. We asked you to come here to teach. That's what I'm talking about. That's favor right there. So I decree to you, everybody connected to this church, everybody connected to this house, I decree in the name of Jesus, God's going to open doors you ain't qualified for, you ain't got no business walking through, you're going to own stuff you was trying to rent. Who am I talking to in here? Somebody say, I received that. Yes, indeed, I received that. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I ain't, listen, I don't have the education, but I got favor. I don't got the money, but I got favor. I don't know all the right people, but I got favor. My God, my God, my God. If you got favor right now, let me know. Hit me right now in the chat. Say, I got favor. I got favor. That's what I'm talking about. I got favor. I got favor. Might not deserve it, but I got favor. I got favor right now. I got favor to open doors no man can close. I got favor to be the, the lender and never to borrow. I got favor to be the head and not the tail. I got favor, 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 favor. Woo! That's what I'm talking about. Now I'm telling y'all, even though I got favor, you ain't gonna like this turn I'm about to do. This switch here. Watch this. Hey, Rogers. Bring it in. My man, where's your helmet? Oh, this is basketball. I got you. Well, I use the same outfit for all of everything. You got coach this. I coach basketball in this. I coach soccer in this. I coach hockey in this. I coach the swimming team. Got the same stuff. Everything I coach. I just coach Keith. Because you'd be confused if I showed up any other kind of way. Anyway, man, listen. Hey, do you know you have favor with God? Do yes. you know? You know you got favor? Say that. Say, I got favor. I got favor. Come on here. Come on here. That's what I'm talking about. See, you, see when you get older, we tell y'all to say, I have favor. But when we get older, we say, I got favor. Because we tell y'all how to say it right. But then when we get old, we start jacking up the English language. But anyway, you, I got favor. I appreciate that. But here's my question, man. If you have favor, why do you as a single man, why do you keep settling for relationships that don't value who you are? Why do you keep talking to people that don't, that don't, why do you keep settling in relationships that don't honor the favor of God on your life? So you have the favor of God on your life, but you don't let it show up in your relationships. Why do you do that, man? What does that have to do with basketball? Man, I don't know what it has to do with basketball. I'm trying to do two things at the same time, and I don't know how to, anyway, man, go back out there, man. Run the ISO for Bron Bron. Run that ISO, get it, ISO. Isolation, single. Ron, Ron, ah. Now listen here, singles, let me tell y'all something. I gotta slide this in here because this is very important. Because some of y'all just typed in the chat room that you have favor from God himself in your life, yet in your relationships, you keep dealing with people that don't respect your worth. What's up with that? All right, clear it out. Give it to Bron, Bron, let him go to work. I know that I am worthy of the very best love. That's where it starts. You can't be the same single when you finally realize you're worthy of the very best love. The very best love. How do you know you're worthy of the very best love? Romans 5 eight says that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm. 
God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in sin, while we were still cutting up, had no real reason to be identified with God or even think about God, when God saw us in that condition, he sent his son to die for us. Now, let me explain something. God is holy, we're not. That ain't real deep. God is holy and perfect, we're unholy and perfect. What that causes is a chasm between us and God. A chasm that cannot be closed by good works. I can never do enough good to close the gap between me and God because God is holy and perfect. All of my good works will fall short. All have sinned and fallen short of the righteousness of God, right? So we, we never can make it there. So what God put into place was a system because in the, in, the, in the word of God, it says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or payment for sins. So what God did was, was put in a sacrificial system by which people could sacrifice animals as an atonement or payment for their sins. And so you keep taking your animals down to the tabernacle and go into the open court area or into the inner court and have your animal sacrifice on the altar. And the blood of that animal would be thrown on the mercy seat and that would be an atonement to cover your sins. That's how it went. But you had to do that all the time over and over again to get your sins covered. Well, what God did through Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ, God gave us one sacrificial lamb in the person of Jesus, and Jesus died once and for all, for all of our sins, for all of eternity. And God gave up his son to suffer in our place, and now through the suffering of Jesus Christ, through us putting our trust in his suffering and in his blood, now the gap has been closed, and we now have a bridge into a relationship with God that was all based on his love. It ain't nothing we did to earn it. We didn't deserve it. In fact, he did it for us while we were still not when, when God chose Jesus, God, when God chose Jesus to die for our sins, he demonstrated love for us while he did it in a time when he could see us not even caring about him. So God didn't wait until we were reaching out to him. He didn't wait until we got it all together. While we were still in sin, Jesus Christ, demonst God demonstrated his love through Jesus Christ. That's an amazing love. I can't even do justice to it in preaching, but I'm saying if God feels you're worthy of that kind of love, why wouldn't you be worthy of the best love from a human being? See, when you understand that, you don't just accept any love or part-time love or side chick love or side beef love or whatever you are at this stage of your life. You, you know that I deserve somebody's time and attention and money and interest in me. I'm worthy of that kind of love. I don't have to see some of y'all been taking any old kind of love because you just want, don't want to be lonely. So you'll take whatever you can get. You take kind of love when people just get around to you. No, you got to say when you check out my new single, you got to understand I'd rather be alone than waiting on somebody that's going to treat me when they want to treat me right because you settle for any kind of love that, that's why you're in a relationship right now that doesn't give you what you give it you give it your all and it's giving you half stuff you know it's, it, it ain't even consistent with you because you're so broken and so thirsty that you'll take any kind of love because you haven't met the unconditional relentless chasing you down love of God that makes you understand I'm worthy of a love of somebody that will die for me when I'm at my worst. So you'll take any kind of love and you'll hang around making sure your phone is working so that you get a call from somebody who only calls you when they have no other options. And then your feelings hurt when they don't buy you flowers. And your feelings hurt when they don't wish you a happy birthday and it ain't even your spouse. They married to somebody else, but you're so hungry and so thirsty that you want attention from somebody that doesn't even belong to you. And I'm saying you need to take that brokenness to God and say, God, show me a kind of love that makes me worthy of a love that's perfect, a love that's pure, so that I can get my own flowers. I can go pick up my own flowers. I can take my own self out for my own birthday and take my own self to my own restaurant and pull my own chair out and sit in my own chair and thank myself and thank my God that I'm here another year so that you don't have to be worried about some inconsistent person that makes you have to behave your way into their love and be enough and do enough and say enough and freak enough and oh, y'all ain't ready for me today and you, you can never do enough and you're still trying to earn a love that ain't even solid. That's your fault. Let God change your mind how you think about yourself. We have you swirling all over this world, attaching yourself to anything that will pay you attention. That's a thinking issue. It ain't just behavior. It started with how you see yourself. It's mental, y'all. 
It's mental. It's mental. You got to get your head right. Got to get your head right. I told you. Being single, 90% of being single, if not more, is mental. Let me, let, me, let me give you an illustration from sports. Let's say you have a sports team, a basketball team that's like mandatory. Like you got to play the sport. There's no tryouts and everybody gets to play and everybody's required to play, right? What you'll find is, is that the real studious players, the real academic guys on the team who could care less about the sport itself tend to, even if they didn't know each other before that season started, tend to gravitate towards one another. They'll, they'll befriend each other. They sit together on the bench like two nerds. Like, like that's not, I'm not, I'm serious. They, they, because they could care less about the game, but they get close to each other for the whole season because of the law of attraction. Like attracts like. Conversely, if you have two guys who didn't even know each other, just like those two guys, they didn't even have to know each other before the season, they were attracted to each other because like attracts like. Conversely, if you have two guys who have extreme prowess at basketball, they are really, really exceptional basketball players, and they didn't know each other ahead of time, but because of their prowess, when they see each other's game, they're naturally attracted to each other. They start sitting together on the bus when they go to games. They put their lockers next to each other. They start befriending each other. Not because they knew each other ahead of time, it is their basketball prowess that attracts them to each other. It's the law of attraction. Like attracts like. What are you saying, Coach Keith? Here's what I'm saying. If all of your relationships are with scrubs, mm, <laughs> everything you're attracting to you is being magnified, it's, it's magnetically attracted from within you. <laughs> Whenever you go fishing, Whatever you catch by way of fish is connected to your bait. Hey, bring it in, guys. Practice is over, church is almost over, and I gotta get the band rehearsal. Let's go. Some single people are in relationships with people, not because you really love them, but because you know you can get a hit from them. You use them to get high whether the hit is sexual or financial or social, they got, they got, they're big time, they're, 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 they're important, they're popular, they got money, or you like their bodies, whatever. But all it is is you're using them to get a hit. Yeah, they're calling you now. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so. <laughs> and, and here's the problem. They don't mind getting high with you, but they would never marry you. Because they see you as a, as a fellow relationship crackhead. And it's hard to view you as a mate when I only see you as a fix. You're just a fix. I don't even see you like that. You're a fix. When I'm feming, that's D.C. Here in D.C. we call it feming. When, you, when I'm feming, I call you, because I know you'll let me hit it. <laughs> Woo! It's a strong coffee today, ain't it? <laughs> and, so, and so, I can't be available for a healthy relationship, because I'm always engaged in a sick one. I can't be, so, you got to be sober to get a healthy relationship. So I can't, I, I'm never sober, because I'm always either trying to get high, or getting high with this person, or coming, crashing down off a of high, so I'm never sober enough, but somebody's got to make a decision with your new single to say, I'm going to break free and be sober enough and get out of these sick relationships. Because let me tell you something. Healthy people don't even attract sick people to them. That's good. If you keep attracting sick people to you, that, is, that means one of two things. Either you're a therapist and you're getting paid to do it, or it's a revelation of your own sickness. Because when you've ever had the flu, anybody ever had the flu? I'm talking about that flu that make your body ache and your head ache and you're dizzy and weak and you're throwing up and you got diarrhea. <laughs> you're like, I don't know which way it's coming this time. <laughs> it's a ginger rail and the Gatorade, everything coming up. If the Lord bring you through that 
and give you your strength back, the last thing you want ever again is the flu. And if you go over somebody's house and they're in their room coughing and you hear that cough and they throwing up, you ain't going in that room. I'm saying you need, treat, you need to treat relationships like this. Some of you who've been in sick relationships in your past, you can tell the sickness when you see it. You ought to say, I ain't even going down that road. I done been sick before. That's my old record. I refuse. You know that you can put a sperm cell inside of a woman that is 0.05 millimeters and housed in that sperm cell is a chromosome. In that chromosome, when that chromosome hits a egg that is fertilized, that woman will not give you a chromosome back. She'll give you back a tax break. <laughs> Y'all ain't ready for this today. She'll give you a tax write-off with one chromosome. Y'all ain't ready for this. That's why your wife will give you back. See, whatever you put in a woman, she'll give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, the good news is, if you love her and sow into her patience and protection and security and loyalty and praise and appreciation, she'll give it back to you. But if you abandon her and you beat her and you abuse her and you neglect her, you're going to see some stuff come out of her that you don't like. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so all you ladies clapping, I want you to know that that doesn't excuse your behavior. It just explains it. You're still responsible for your little attitude and your nastiness. You got to get healed of that stuff and get whole again so that God can heal you from your past and protect you from your future so that you stop dealing with jokers that don't value you. Something wrong with you. Turn me up right here. Something wrong with you. Something wrong with you that you don't feel good enough about yourself to find a man with a job that respects you and won't put his hands on you. Something's wrong with you when you're always attracted to drug dealers and crackheads and sick men. There is something sick about you that makes you think you're supposed to help people. I don't know who I'm talking to in here. Hey y'all, listen, I'm slam out of time for today. I'm really out of time for this series, which is why I really need to ask y'all to do me a favor. When we started this Verify series, we promised you it would go for four weeks. But I would like your permission to continue this series because I have more things I'd like to share with you all as singles. But it's really your call. So I need to know by way of vote. I know this is diff different, but in America we vote. We're supposed to anyway. Just let me know in the chat, do you want me to continue this series? Yes or no? I'm, I'm waiting to hear from you all. We're gonna be monitoring this. If you say yes, I'll be back next week with Verify Part 5. If you say no, we'll end it today. We're cool, we won't be offended. It's your call. I'm willing to come back next week with more material. It's up to y'all. Please let us know. And if you say yes, I promise you, we'll be back next week with Verify Part 5. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn it over to your chat host now who's going to end our service and wrap everything up for us. And let me get out of here before they... Before they Good job, man. Good, Good job. job. He was all right. Yeah, y'all yeah, yeah, go with the disrespect again. Excuse me. That's oh, how y'all... Excuse me. Y'all just some disrespectful people, man. That's why, you know what? That's why I'm turning my... I'm going to put my application in for Third Baptist. I'm going on the way to do what I need to do.